Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, president of Artists Talk on Art, ATOA. This is our 77th virtual open studio. We present every Monday, occasionally not on holidays. ATOA is a 501c3. We're a nonprofit. We've been in the Lower West Side of New York City since 1975. All our talks have been live, but as a result of COVID, we've switched to this Zoom format. Um, we hope to go back January 1 to our location at 12 West 12th Street. It's the first Presbyterian church. And we will continue a combination of live talks once a month and Zoom presentations like this on the other Mondays. We do have, do have new formats coming. Keep an eye on our website. And by the way, this talk is being recorded. It will end up on our YouTube channel. You can visit our previous YouTubes and access is available through our website. Um, if you'd like to contribute, by the way, all our talks are free. You're contributing by just being here and sharing ideas. And as well, there's a chat function. If you take a look, uh, a co-curator of a space has listed a space that you might find interesting. But if you would like to contribute financially, all the information is on our website. It's atoanyc.org. And if you're not on our mailing list and you'd like to be, information is there, you could always reach out to me. Um, tonight, uh, October 25th, 2021, Lori Horowitz has organized Penetrating Layers, an exciting presentation. Um, there'll be three artists presenting, Lori, Kellen Alder, I got that right, Kellen, and Chris Ann Amber Reed. Definitely like stepped on that. Um, and I look forward to an exciting talk. I won't say much more. I'll hand it over to Lori. I will say, you know our format. Feel free to jump in anytime, not only with a question, but with a statement. We do like to support artists. It's, if it's as simple as love the work, that works for us. And if you would rather put it in the chat, use the chat function as well. Use that for anything you'd like, anything you'd want to share with the audience. So Lori, firstly, for ATOA, I thank you very much. You've organized this and thank you beforehand. Welcome. Lori. Okay. Hi everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen right now. And uh, let's see. Hold on. Show you uh, my messy studio and some of my work. It always takes a minute. We always have minor technical difficulties. It wouldn't be. Are no you problem. seeing? Are you seeing this? No, not. Oh, not you're me. not. I'm. I, I'm under the impression you're seeing it. So hang on. Let's. Yeah, I see it. Peg Riley, I see it. You see it? Mm-hmm. It's you, right? What? Is it you oh, no. seeing a video? No. You seeing a video? No. You're not seeing a video. No. No. Okay, so let's go back. Hang on. Uh, Are you sharing your screen? I press share screen and- Did you press share at the bottom of share uh, screen? The share, there we ah, go. Yeah, yes. now you're seeing me, here we go, yep. sorry. Sorry about the delay. Okay, so again, this is my messy studio uh, for those who have not visited it yet. Um, during COVID, it's pretty tough or it has been tough to get people out to your studio. As you can see, it's fairly full. So been uh, keeping where, busy. Where is your studio? Where is it located? Uh, in Dix Hills on Long Island. Uh -huh. That's why you have a great space. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm very fortunate to have a space. Yes, and there I am. Now, don't worry about not hearing Lori right now. There's something inside the video. Oh, there it was, there it's going. And now we'll go into 
my presentation. And let's just give me one second. Uh, One second. I was doing so well before, and now I'm not seeing how to run it. But okay, there we go. Okay, I'm going back. Okay, so anyhow, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I am a native New Yorker, Long Islander. Um, and I have worked as a professor, a set, uh, scenic designer uh, for film, TV, and theater. And I also ran a non for profit gallery um, on Long Island and curated uh, many shows. And in doing that, I learned so much. But at the same time, I needed to stop doing that because I could not concentrate on my own work. So right now I have been uh, really um, producing quite a bit of work uh, and been involved in a lot of group shows as well as individual shows and have shown internationally as well as locally. And um, in my work, I explore the overlooked interactions between individuals and I explore their social disconnect as well as their common humanity. Um, my work is really a study of personalities and environments and record the, uh, the moments of humanity I find. I use a camera as my sketchbook and I take pictures, hundreds of pictures and basically draw from that to create these pieces of work. Um, in my first series, uh, well, we're talking about penetrating layers. Uh, my work reveals um, reveals uh, what's behind the surface, uh, as well as my co-presenters work uh, as well. Um, people put on facades and we tend to make judgments about them. So the idea is getting past those surface judgments and understanding what lies beneath. My first piece here, it's called All American. And this was taken from a photograph in Southern California of a, a Latino uh, hot dog vendor and selling the all American hot dog and making his living. Love Birds is another paper mache piece. And the paper mache stems from my work in theater. Uh, paper mache is a fantastic material. It's sturdy, it's lightweight, it's non-toxic. And it is also, um, very inexpensive to work with and easy on your hands. So uh, Lovebirds is taken from uh, Larry, who is a character who frequents Washington Square Park. I thought of him as an indigent uh, man who really was kind of lost his way where in actuality, after taking pictures of him for two years, found out that he's a very well-spoken man who just loves birds and he's a member of uh, an aviary society. I then transitioned into encaustic wax and um, I know most people uh, paint with it, but I tried uh, my hand at sculpting with it. It's sculpted over uh, aluminum wire mesh and basically the aluminum wire takes the form up to uh, close to a half inch within the finished piece. So this piece is Dread and he's uh, a character from uh, Coney Island. Um, he's again, encaustic wax, aluminum fiber. This piece is called Squatter, another uh, man from Southern California, Venice Beach, who again, I thought was possibly homeless but when I looked closer at him, he was wearing a J. Crew jacket. His hair was very nicely done. And he was a retired actor. Um, often I get to speak to these people and often get to know them. Uh, and luckily I was able to share his story. He was able to share his story with me. Uh, this piece was done based on um, a Cuban woman. Uh, both Kellen and I did a residency in Cuba, 
and it was kind of eye-opening. So this was a street vendor selling cigars with her little doll and um, basically uh, making some extra money. They live on very little. Uh, they have just enough to eat. And the facade is that everything's wonderful and beautiful there where really uh, people are struggling so much. This picture was taken in Coney Island, which I later made a solo print etching. Uh, this was during my residency in Cuba. And Chris Ann was nice enough to give me a crash course in solar etching before I left. I was a total novice in a group of very experienced printmakers. So this was the first print I made. Um, it was called Four Under Four. And subsequently, I made this sculptural piece called Living Doll. And this is a little bit larger than life. Uh, the um, father was with one of his uh, children in this piece. It is uh, torch copper wire mesh, aluminum. Uh, the face is sculpted in encaustic wax. And um, it also has that translucency where you can look through the surface and sort of try and get past the surface and understand his cir circumstance. Lori, let me ask you a quick question. I, I bumped yes. into John, John Ahern uh, yesterday. He's a good friend and a Bronx artist. And when I look at your work, he comes to mind. Are you familiar with John? And I am actually, he is a family friend. And I actually didn't know his work until more recently. I knew he was an artist. I knew uh, he was friends with my sister, a whole bunch of connections, but I didn't know his work well. Um, his work is really casting. So he was doing a lot of body casts, which is really uh, taking these individuals and making really sculptures out of them. Um, I'm basically working from a photo, sculpting these pieces, from, you know, from nothing. And uh, uh, it's it's a different skill set. So um, yeah, I am familiar with him and his work. Yeah, what caught me is you're both in sort of full relief. Um, <laughs> that's what sort of caught my eye. Yeah, yeah, no, his work is very, you know, sort of deals with the uh, common person um, and unveiling, you know, their their personas as well. Okay, so during COVID, I had to switch from dealing with people and interviewing people, taking pictures and going back into nature. So uh, I started taking a lot of nature walks and I stumbled upon these roots called cedar knees. And I took hundreds of pictures of them and they looked to me sort of uh, like an exodus of people trying to find place or, or, and especially with what was going on or is going on with so much displacement, the uh, trouble at the borders, uh, people um, trying to find sanctuary. I started to uh, draw into these roots. These roots are about three inches high and they take on sort of a more monu men, um, monumental uh, look. Uh, and there are many, many figures that are drawn into them. And as I work them with colored pencil, the figures start to reveal themselves. These are two of the earlier pieces that I did. And they have that very gray kind of scary, haunting feeling to them. And this is really a result of the beginnings of COVID. These are two individual small roots. This one I call Thinker and this one Mother Earth. Again, only about three inches tall, these pieces. And then I draw into them with colored pencil. And uh, this one is a group um, called Together. And this one is Sorrow. But um, it seems that as I look into these pieces, these characters are really in there and it takes hours really to get them, to coax them to come out as I draw them. These are two more. And I did about 75 of these drawings and I tried to do, you know, one every two days during the height of COVID and it 
tended to keep my sanity during this, I think. Lori, these remind me of Kathy Kollowitz's pieces. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was also, wondering if you looked at her. Uh, uh, she's a, one of my heroes, yeah. So I'm very familiar with her work as well, yeah. Um, this piece, the, the light and the color started to emerge through this. Uh, although they were still dealing with, you know, it's called traveling through the time of COVID and pilgrimage, um, they almost felt like, you know, like these Dutch masters type of uh, characters. And I actually even started to look up, trying to find out historically if they fit into place somewhere. And I was uh, not sure where the influence is, but this is what came out. And you can see as I started to go into spring, the color started coming into the pieces. This is a large uh, installation piece that I did during um, a residency at Michael David and Company. Um, Lori, Lori, let me ask you a question. I, yeah. uh, Jenna last has asked a great question. Can you explain your process in the wood-like drawings that she asked you to draw on the actual wood? And I'd like to point out, um, when you're getting that figurative form out of uh, organic form, like a tree root, you're seeing what I like to call consilience of form. In other words, if you hit, you'll see it in clouds too. And right. if you, in certain forms, you'll realize everything is related. So if you go into roots, you will see human form because after all, we are all organic. and We're coming from the same root in a way. But I think Jenna, she'd like to know um, what's your process, if you could explain. So the process is basically uh, taking photographs, um, very close up photographs of these roots in different forms. Uh, you know, I, I've gone back, I've taken them with different depth of field, different lighting, different times of the day, different um, weather conditions, uh, winter, summer, spring, just to get the different lighting on these pieces. And then, um, I print them, I have them printed, and then uh, they're done on a heavyweight drawing paper. And then I just go in with uh, colored pencils and just draw it directly into them. So um, now these pieces, <laughs> this piece exactly, is about 10 foot tall. And uh, the roots are actually printed on a type of gauze fabric. And then I go into them sculpt them, make them three-dimensional. There's a lot of wire, there's a lot of sewing, there's copper uh, and all sorts of materials. So it was really taking a lot of the different techniques I had done in the past and combining them together to make like one big installation piece. Shadow was very important in my work, lighting. Um, so, so this was a big piece that, that started the more three-dimensional pieces. I then went back to a smaller piece. This one's called Divining, and it is aluminum, brass, copper wire, and caustic wax, photography, and fiber on gauze. So it's a everything but the kitchen sink. Uh, again, um, very dark, very, um, I guess all of the COVID was getting to me. I think it was getting to a lot of people I knew as well. And it was just, you know, finding your way through through the darkness. Uh, this piece, again, from one small six inch root uh, that looked like a boat to me, it's called Castaways and with a lot of what was going on and people trying to find place. Uh, this was a piece that came out of that. Um, it's uh, 54 inches wide, so it's a fairly large uh, wall piece. So uh, I also started to go back to the positions and the body language and the figures that I had drawn and getting away from the roots a little bit directly, um, I was translating those positions or those emotions into figures, uh, which I'm most comfortable with. Uh, this one was the first piece, uh, it's, uh, sculpted chicken wire, which is then wrapped with uh, spun copper and then woven copper on top of that. And on top of that, it has sewn uh, black wire mesh. Um, quite a complicated piece. Uh, 
The next one after that is called Shrouded. And uh, although the uh, figure itself was done in a similar way, I switched out the black wire mesh for shrouding, uh, which is gauze. Uh, it was at a point where um, there was a lot of death. Uh, there were a lot of, I was in Bushwick doing this residency. There were supposedly bodies uh, piled up at the hospital there. Um, and my brother-in-law had just passed away. So uh, it was like this feeling of deep despair. Um, the gauze represents a sort of skin, which is translucent uh, to see past the surface, as well as in death in many religions, uh, the death shroud uh, is a type of gauze that the body is wrapped in. This piece is called Grieve. It's sort of a, a counterpart to shrouded uh, the male version, also done with the same materials. I do want to read two comments. Uh, Wendy lists is that it's fascinating how you pull the figures from the natural root formations, beautiful. And Babs Rangold says, I love the big installation pieces and innovative creations, and certainly your play with different materials, I'll add that. Thanks. Okay, this piece is called Uprising and it's uh, taking place where all the looting and all the craziness had started to go on. People were starting, trying to get out of ca captivity. And it was a combination between people uprising and taking advantage and also people helping others rise up from their illness, the despair and the seclusion. This piece uh, was done, it's called Veiled Innocence, and uh, it was a very technically um, challenging piece. So in some of my earlier shadow pieces, I came across the shadow, which was this, you know, black shadow, but it was really done with uh, copper and different materials. And I realized that I could mimic the shadow almost identically uh, if I sculpted the, um, the piece in black wire uh, screen mesh and sewed the whole thing together. So this one is called Veiled Innocence. And this one I think is the most successful of this series. It's called Sitting in the Shadows. And some of these projections are up to nine feet tall if I have the space and the resolution is um, very, very uh, sharp uh, if it's projected with a single bulb. And um, you really can't distinguish between the sculpture itself and the shadow. And uh, a lot of it is showing isolation, seclusion, and um, what was going on at the time. Um, I went to uh, doing some small studies. Uh, this is a new type of copper that I came upon, which is a lot easier to manipulate and I can get tremendous detail. These pieces are, um, the black images are the shadows actually, and the copper is, is the sculptural piece. Here's another one. Um, these small pieces have been, um, Patina. In the past, I didn't use any patina on my work. And now I have been playing with ammonia and vinegar and salts and all sorts of chemicals and doing my mad science and really getting incredible color out of the copper. So this piece was done, which is a combination of, uh, you know, the past. Sorry, I don't know what just happened. Um, let me just go back one. Well, doesn't matter. Here's another one. <laughs> uh, this one is called uh, Beneath the Surface and it's using all the different techniques of uh, encaustic wax, the sculpted um, photos. Again, these pieces have gotten lighter and more colorful during springtime. And my focus is more towards the water and um, dealing with the out of doors. Again, this piece is, uh, I'm using a patina and getting all sorts of different blues and, and colors to it. And this is uh, the most recent 
a piece like this, again, dealing with the water and the lake. I'm fortunate to um, have a place that's by this beautiful lake upstate, and I spend a lot of time swimming there, not wanting to know what's beneath the surface. Um, I have a friendly heron who comes and visits me and a snapping turtle. Um, it is uh, a place of solace, of peace, and at the same time kind of represents the whole idea of we never know what's really going on underneath, what's behind, and we just really deal with um, what we see on the surface. Glory, I'm gonna read a few comments and then feel free to go on maybe another five minutes. Yep. Um, uh, Robin Halpern says, beautiful, interesting, moving and innovative creations. Uh, Regina Gratis, marvelous and emotional art. Thank you, Lori. She asks, have you heard of the sculptor Peter Bulo? No, I have not. And Bulo, B-U-L-L-O-W. And uh, Mary Herbisek says, hi everyone, so nice to be here. I see the figures as the dead rising from the underworld with mythic stories about their desire to come back into the world. Very poetic phrasing, phrasing Mary, and makes us see it a little better maybe. Elaine Forrest says, Laurie, the shadows are as magical as the original piece. And I think we'll all agree there is something magical there. Oh, it's Bulo, B-U-L-O-W, and Regina has put a link into the chat. Peggy Q says, this is very moving. So you're doing, okay. you're doing good. Okay, well, this is the last photo here. So uh, this is what I'm currently working on and I am uh, collecting uh, images to keep me busy through the winter. So I have hundreds of photos of fungus, of uh, lilies and of water reflections that I am making into three dimensional pieces. These are very small pieces for me. Um, out of my comfort zone. So we'll see where it takes me and I'm sure it will turn into a very large installation piece. Okay, and that's, that's it for me. Okay, and with that, I'm going to introduce my... Uh, let me, Lori, let me okay. first what we always do, round of applause, beautiful work. Thank you. Really nice. Um, Fran Beeler says, beautiful work. Love the new fungus pieces. Um, M. Annenberg says, unique, creative, and beautiful to look at. Nancy Feldman, thank you, Laurie. Incredible work. Bab, Babs Rheingold asks, what is spun copper? And before you answer that, I'll just read. Eileen Hoffman says, it's so wonderful to see all this work. It's amazing what you do with the materials. Of course, I love your use of the wire and gauze. And Barbara Carrillo says, terrific, Lori. So much I haven't seen before. So to Babs' question, what mm -hmm. is spun copper? So uh, spun copper is, uh, cop it's almost like a copper wool. It's, um, it's shredded copper. And what I do is I break it down into very thin sheets so it's translucent and then I wrap it around the figure. And then the other material I use is uh, a copper that's woven very loosely and that I sew together over that to keep the copper, um, the copper wool in place. So uh, I, I do a lot of experimenting, a lot of sourcing for materials uh, so I can play with them and, and uh, you know, push the limits that I can find. Uh, Mary Herbisek says, your works are transporting, makes me speechless. <laughs> Pearl, Thank you. Pearl, Pearl <laughs> Golden, fabulous transitions of ideas and innovations in materials and techniques. Really beautiful work. Um, Lori, go ahead, introduce the other presenters and we'll move forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Kellen Alder, who is a fabulous painter, wonderful artist. Uh, Kellen has created portraits for editorials such as The New Yorker, 
um, documented uh, sideshow performers in Coney Island. She's traveled extensively to portray Aboriginal elders of Australia, Papua New Guinea, tribal warriors, and the Lacandon Mayans of the Mexican rainforest. As a daughter of a Mexican immigrant, Kellen's recent work explores the connection to humanity through her rich cultural ancestry. She employs a sense of purpose with an inherent duty, duty to advocate for her Latinx community and speak out against injustice. So let's hear it for Kellen. I'm sure she won't disappoint. Thank you, Lori, and thank you, Barry, um, uh, for inviting me to be part of this, this wonderful artist talk on art. Um, and Lori, your work just blows me away. Your facility with so many different materials is just incredible. That's thank you. Right. So thank you. I'm going to go to my PowerPoint. Hopefully, it'll so I can share my screen, right? Uh, All right, so everyone can see this? Yes, well done. Okay. All right, um, my talented partner took this photo of me and my sleeping dog, um, Michael Dracopoulos, who's a wonderful photographer. But, um, my career, my artist philosophy sort of, uh, is, I attribute a lot of it to this, person, Marshall Erisman, who is the chairman of the School of Visual Arts and started this wonderful program that I entered for my master's called Illustration as Visual Essayism, where we, um, where the artists sought to be more than just a hand and duplicating um, photographs that we were handed that we, um, he got us to go out and seek our own stories and, um, and to uh, portray them. So uh, he's my teacher, mentor, friend. Um, while I was at the School of Visual Arts, I connected with the New Yorker magazine and uh, portraits have always been my favorite thing to do, but I tried to follow that philosophy to um, when I could to actually meet the people that I would, was doing portraits of. This is, so I had that privilege to meet people like Grace Paley, this is the author and I came to her home and I just felt like I got more out of it and they got more out of it if uh, it added another dimension to the portrait to actually have that personal connection. Um, this is Frederick Weissman. He's a, a film documentarian, has won awards at the, for the Academy for, for the work that he's done. He's a bit of a muckraker. Um, so I did this type of work going out and sort of documenting people in, in portraiture. And I got the wanderlust, wanderlust to go to Australia. I, I lived there for five years and worked for the Australian Geographic and um, was able to go on expeditions and also documented um, uh, what what the scientists would bring up, whether we were out on, on a boat or in the middle of the desert. And it was a wonderful experience. But I also began my own series of work of uh, doing portraits of people who I thought were important Australians. This man's name is Percy Tresize. He was one of the first white men to be initiated into Aboriginal tribes. And he also discovered some of the oldest Aboriginal rock art in Australia. So um, I think this, this piece in particular kind of portrays what the title of our, our theme tonight of, of layers and trying to tell a story about somebody, not just through portraiture, but through um, what they've done. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, Bill Nige. He's a, the, uh, an elder of Kakadu National Park. Uh, quite a poetic man. So I did a series of going out into the Aboriginal bush to meet different Aboriginal tribe elders. It's a portrait of women in uh, Cape York Peninsula. And one of the most dramatic things I ever uh, lived through was driving through uh, a bushfire. And it was deliberately set by the Aboriginal people to uh, 
to kind of cut down the the growth so that the smaller animals would come back out and and eat the, the shoots. But after living in Australia for five years, I felt like I wanted to come home to home, meaning the Americas. My, as as uh, Lori said, my mom is Mexican, my grandmother's Mexican. I wanted to know more about my Mexican roots. So I, uh, uh, this is actually a, uh, a painting of my grandmother's chest uh, of the, her belongings that she brought over to United States. And when she married an American citizen, my grandfather was North American, um, in Mexico, she lost her citizenship there. And then when she came to United States, she was denied citizenship. So for many years, she had no country. And I, I thought that was really unfair. But um, anyway, uh, when I came back, I uh, immediately went down to Chiapas, which is the most southerly state of Mexico, and started working with uh, Lacandon Mayan people trying to uh, document their disappearing culture. And I, um, I, I was uh, inspired by uh, a Swiss journalist named Trudy Bloom, who had been there as an advocate for trying to preserve their culture for many years and their rainforest that was the Mexican government and others were coming in, cutting down. This was the early 1990s and um, there was a lot of change going on the, the children, I ended up doing art workshops with the children because they would follow me around. And so I'd bring them supplies and they were my, my translators and they would tell me the names in Mayan of, of corn, different colors of corn. These are just sketches. I did a lot of paintings and some sculpture too, but um, this was one of the elders wives doing what all Lacandon women did in that time. And she's wear, still wearing the traditional dress, um, shucking corn to make tortillas. Oh. This piece um, was a pivotal piece for me because instead of just documenting, I started to put in my opinions about what was going on with the, these people that I fell in love with after decades of, of going back and forth and spending time there. And I was seeing their culture um, being encroached upon by many outside inf influences, like the government, politics, religion, uh, products like Coca-Cola. They're not even, the girls aren't wearing their traditional dress anymore in this particular village. Um, and then this is uh, uh, more about my story, my family story, about my where my grandmother and great grandmother and uh, ancestors come from. They come from the area of Mazatlan, which means the uh, um, the area of plenty of deer in the indigenous language, and it sort of travels over to the right to where my mother is ten years old and and getting her. Uh, first communion in Arizona, where my family, where my maternal family traveled to, uh, immigrated to. Um, and I also have to say, I mean, my grandmother was a very well educated woman. She taught herself basically English when she was living in Mexico, but she suffered a lot of uh, discrimination when she came to the United States. She would open her door and find out that somebody had painted a uh, Mexican pig on it. And so, uh, anyway, um, so. Ellen, I do want to read some of the comments. There are so many and they're all so positive. Um, uh -huh. Jenna Lash says, dramatic and powerful images of women, of the woman surrounded by the bushfire. Oh, thank you. Gina Greatest says, thank you, Kellen. There is so much we can learn from people who lived on the land for thousands of years start fires to bring out the small animals who can eat some of the new buds. Mm -hmm. um, Mark Josloff, Kellen, Kellen, your work is a true fusion of head, heart, and hands. You are so <laughs> sensitive in your thinking and art. Robin Halpern says, thanks, Kellen. Your work is so creatively executed. You both capture the likeness of your subjects but you add your own creative markings to keep it from being stiff and formal. 
Mm, thank you very much. That's very encouraging. Maybe I'll pick up a paintbrush again tomorrow. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't show you guys, though. I did it. You're talking about beautiful. We were all talking about beautiful and uh, what beautiful art is and ugly art. And I had a whole series in Australia of roadkill, but I didn't put any of those in here. <laughs> anyway, but thank you very much for your comments, everybody. Ellen, be before you continue, I just want to remind everybody, this is ATOA, Artist Talk on Art. We're a 501c3. If you'd like to contribute, by the way, all our talks are free, but all the information is on our website. I do want to acknowledge there are three board members present, Norma Green Greenwood, Fran Beeler, and Mitch Pilnick. Um, and I'd like to say, if you would like to organize our talk or be a part of this, go on our website. We have a new format coming out in 2022. You'll see Jacqueline Radda's information and you can email her and she'll send you a form to fill out. If you can't find it, always feel free to reach out to me and we'll get you the information. Um, we sort of grow by people recommending people and coming. So you're all welcome to submit. Go ahead, Kellen, thank you. Right. Uh, this this piece is kind of a crazy piece that started with a, a dream. I, I, it's a bit surreal. I know the perspective is all wacky, which I, I didn't care about, but um, it was a dream. I, 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 you know, I have lighter skin, but a lot of my cousins and relatives have darker skin and, and they experienced a lot of discrimination and something that I don't really feel but in this dream I wasn't allowed to get on this bus and um and I felt that feeling of exclusion and um so any but there's a lot going on here it's about women my daughter is who's been my muse since she was born is 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 portraying different um, Mexican icons like um from the Virgin of Guadalupe who is a symbol of solidarity to the Yorona, who's a um, kind of more of a Halloween character who lost her children. Um, and then there's all the crosses represent all the people that, well, some of the people who have died trying to cross borders and, and it's about borders. And um, the mountains in the background is uh, the Chiricahua mountain range that my parents' uh, property looked out on um, and it, it just made me think the, the the land that we call the U.S. and the land we call Mexico, it you know the indigenous people who lived there before these countries existed um, didn't have these kind of barriers. But um, right. So um, I started doing a series of portraits of women who have been separated from their children. This is a portrait of Deborah Barrios. She was racially profiled, pulled over. Um, she was going to have to leave the country, but her, both her children were born here, and uh, she chose instead to go into a sanctuary church in the city to, to wait until she could try and get her legal processing done. And while she was there for 14 months, she wrote a play. She studied to, for a sociology degree, and just a, an amazing woman. This is another version of that portrait. The monarch butterfly is a logo for Im immigrants. Mm. This is a friend of mine who was in the wrong place at the wrong time and was, um, she, although she was going through the legal channels the way she was supposed to, um, she was taken away and put in a detention center for nine months. Her two, two uh, teenage daughters, um, were left alone and um, to well with her hus her husband, but to fend for themselves. But she had to use up the college fund that she'd been saving with her husband for for many years, with thirty thousand dollars, to be able to get out of detention and to proceed with her asylum. This is another story I, I actually um, saw on um, HBO. It's called. Um, uh, separated, torn, torn apart, separated at the border. It was a story about Vilma and Yesvi Carillo. Uh, Vilma and her husband worked in Georgia uh, um, in the fields and their daughter uh, Yesvi was born in Georgia. Then Vilma had to go back to Guatemala because her mother was dying and her husband became an alcoholic, very abusive, knocked her teeth out, uh, threatened to kill both her and her daughter. So she came back to the United States seeking asylum when they found out that her daughter was born in the United States, 
they took her daughter away, put her in foster care with, uh, with the intention to adopt her, have her adopted out and put <gasps> Vilma in detention for nine months. So I was so horrified that I chucked, I, I chased down the journalists and um, to get in touch with them to fly to Georgia. This is right before COVID to meet them because I felt they, I wanted to do their portrait. This is just another uh, rendition. This is a, a, a etching um, and a gicle. And because I think sometimes you have to tell more than just the portrait of, Vilma worked in Georgia. She was working. Uh, she was freed by, mm -hmm. thankfully, by Tahare Justice Center um, ha, is an advocacy group that hired a lawyer to get them out. They were reunited, but still they're struggling. Um, you know, she works for very little money picking onions in Georgia. So this is, and she misses where she comes from in Guatemala, but you know, she knows it's a better life for her here and for her daughter primarily. And this is a friend of mine who is a photographer, Carlos, and also an advocate for, for rights for, for Latinos and undocumented citizens. Uh, Kellen, I do want to uh, mention a few of the comments. Um, Babs Reingold says, I like the use of the border around the image. It has a quilt-like feeling. Mm -hmm. Regina Gratis asks, is there a place we can donate to your friend who used up the money meant for college. Oh, so nice. Mark Josloff yeah. says, I feel Frida Kahlo when I observe your paintings. Was her <laughs> body of work any kind of an influence on you? Uh, yes, she definitely, I mean, she is. I love Frida Kahlo. I, I you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, she was kind of a groundbreaker for, for Mexican women artists, definitely. But thank you. I'll move on because I know where you were. Chris Ann still has to uh, <laughs> present her wonderful work, but um, I'm I'm very influenced by Mexican iconography, like the lottery cards. It's, it's sort of a, like a, a bingo game, and uh, and Benito Juarez is was the first and last fully indigenous president of Mexico. Um, so he's a hero of mine, but this is also an ode to Larry Rivers, who did a, um, some prints of um, George Washington and the bald eagle. So this is Benito Juarez and the Mexican eagle, but also he endorsed uh, lottery cards as a way to help people in Mexico become literate, just the regular populace. And it would always, I've, I've kind of taken this to another level, but they're simple cards that have the name of what they're depicting, an object, an animal, whatever, and then a number so that people can um, reference that. So that, and I go, um, I use that a lot. This is called uh, Juan, uh, Blue Crow, not, not Juan Crow, which is kind of a pun on uh, Jim Crow laws as, oh. as applied to Mexican Americans or Latinos, and also breaking through borders. El Jefe, this is a smaller piece uh, of, it's just, it's a, a jaguar. He, he actually existed. I think he's passed away now, but he would, you know, we set these human barriers, but the animals go back and forth, whether they're birds or this jaguar, he would pass through Mexico and Arizona back and forth. And I think there's now an, another jaguar named Elvis that has been doing that. And then I love the uh, the Mexican wrestlers and the name for a wrestler is luchador, which means also to struggle. And um, so, and often they embody the the spirits of animals. So this is El Aguila. He's the 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 eagle warrior. It kind of invented, but there there are eagle wrestling Mexican wrestling warriors. And then this is just sort of a cathartic piece for me of um, um, uh, she's uh, uh, the goat capra, but I'm using a lot of the lottery card imagery throughout it. Amazing. The monarch again as a symbol of immigrants. Oh. And then this piece is actually behind me. Um, this is my response to COVID because I couldn't travel to Mexico. Um, I missed the crush of crowds. I, I just, I went in a different, I just had to paint this and I've started now 
a series on uh, the Day of the Dead. This is in Chiapas and each village it's celebrated completely differently. Oh, not completely differently, but in, uh, you know, differently. Um, and it's, I also love Coney Island. So it's like Coney Island meets Mexico here. And anyway, well, that's it. Oh, it's wonderful. Very nice. I'll stop the screen sharing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Brilliant work. It's just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll read a few of the comments and then anyone feel free to jump in and say what you like. Um, Walter Brown says, these are heartbreaking stories. In this day and age, you are carrying on one of the most important artist functions to inform and bring attention to the present moment. Um, Regina Greatest put a link in uh, for an artist who also does collage with lots of historical information on it. Um, Robin Halpern asks, what medium are you using? Watercolor, paint on canvas, digital, size? Um, I use, well, I've, I've not watercolor, but uh, acrylics on canvas, oil on canvas. Sometimes I start, actually the paintings behind me, I start with acrylic mm -hmm. and then I, I build up more of the creaminess that I, I feel like I can't always get with acrylics in oils. Um, and then also I showed some prints, print like etchings and solar plate etchings uh, with uh, monotypes on top and chine collet, um, drawing, whatever, you know, whatever's, whatever's available. Could you put your uh, website on the uh, <laughs> chat? Sure. Thank you. Also, Omar Noble, I think, sums it up in one word, amazing followed by five exclamation points. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Nancy uh, Buetti says, I love the stories that your work tells. And in the more recent works, the combination of collage, printmaking and printing, you have meshed them so beautifully. Oops. Mitch Pilnick, a board member of ATOA says, Kellen, it was a pleasure to meet you and your artwork at Lori's curated pop-up show beneath the surface this past May in Soho. Your range is quite unique. M. Annenberg, I think it's Marcy, says beautiful and poetic. Larry says, I like your painting of Marshall Ar Arisman from SVA. Yay. And Mary Herbisek says, your works represent the true essence of globalism, respecting the local, informs that connect with the sophisticated global vocabulary. Mm. Wow. Can I write that down? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Copy and paste off the chat. I just want to thank everybody here. Uh, part of what we do is, you know, we support each other at artists and it's, it can't be more evident by the responses everybody sends. And it, you know, in a simple way, it sends a lot of love, but it sends a lot more too. And it really, you know, as a, uh, Kellen said, you know, I'll get back to painting. You, you, we really inspire each other. And it's mm. sort of the best of the hive mentality. Um, yeah, we spend a lot of time alone too. I mean, um, so it's, it's good to connect that way, especially now <laughs> with COVID. So, yes. Um, I think we'll move on now. We'll move to okay. Chris Ann Ambery. Welcome, Chris Ann, and uh, introduce yourself. Let us know where you're from. Hello, Lori, were you doing an introduction or I'll just- If you want, you can take it away or I could just, I'll just say, say a, a little short thing. I met Chris Ann a number of years ago when she was a student um, and her work has changed from doing sculptural pieces, figurative sculptural pieces to being a, a really an amazing printmaker. She does beautiful, beautiful work, uh, mainly solar, uh, solar plate, printmaking and she'll tell you more about that but she's very accomplished and uh take it away Chris Ann. all right thank you Th thank you um for inviting me wait hold on a second am I sharing this yes okay um hold on we, we don't we don't see it just yet Chris Ann. oh you're not seeing it are you We're seeing, seeing you oh 
All right. So open what you'd like on your computer screen and then hit the share screen button. Oh, got it. Hold on. There you go. Okay. Oh, let me get see if I can get to there the slideshow. Okay. There we go. Um, okay, so um, first of all, I want to thank you so much for inviting me to um, participate in this artist talk. And I am truly humbled presenting with both Lori and Kellen. Um, their work is amazing. And um, I th find it interesting too, some of the connections I hear from them and, you know, like some of the connections between my work as well. Um, but my work is definitely very different. It's really at this point, um, it's not figurative at all. Um, but I did begin, well, I grew up in, I grew up in Queens. Um, I'm a New York girl through and through. Um, grew up in Queens. I went to Parsons School of Design uh, where I did my undergrad in illustration. And um, I was on a very different path at that point. I was, um, you know, being an illustrator, my work was very heavily rooted in um, in the figure in, I was working primarily with painting, drawing, watercolor. Um, I hated printmaking when I took it and did my undergrad at Parsons. Um, I just, it didn't resonate with me. It wasn't immediate enough. Um, so I, it was, it's kind it's of surprising. If you want more. I'm sorry. Oh, it's kind of surprising that I find myself like um, at, at this point in my career, turning back to printmaking. Um, but anyway, so um, as time went on and I had my family, I really um, stopped working professionally altogether. And I just um, focused on raising my family. Uh, I always continued to draw, I continued to be creative, but I never thought I would come back to having a professional career in, um, in art. And I kind of got prompted by my daughter's friends begging me to teach them how to draw once they found out I was an artist. Um, I, I kind of got prompted to go back to, to go back to school primarily for art education. Um, and then after taking two art classes, um, I decided I needed to just continue with my art. And um, I went on for my MFA um, in printmaking. Uh, at LIU, I graduated from LIU Post here on Long Island. Um, okay, so um, the crazy thing is, like I said, I hated printmaking when I was doing my undergrad. Um, never thought I would come back to printmaking and I just started falling in love with all of the different processes and how far I could push them, especially etching. Um, I played around a lot with large scale screen prints and that's, that's kind of what I was working on when I first met Lori. I was working on large scale screen prints and doing some sculptural pieces that were combined with printmaking. Um, but what I loved about etching was that you could kind of drop like the metal plates into the acid and I could watch the acid biting away at the plates and it fascinated me. Um, I love the surfaces that were created. However, at that point in time, I really wasn't aware of how toxic those chemicals were. That, and the fumes were, um, were really, again, the fumes that were being thrown off by the metal working in the acid bath were extremely toxic. Um, and when I started to begin to feel some of the effects like um, on my skin would get very itchy and I started oh. investigating you know, what was going on with the processes. I said, mm, I really kind of wanted to pull back and investigate more, um, or I should say less toxic ways of working. So I investigated um, saline sulfate etching, which really is um, an etching solution that's made out of salt and um, table salt and copper sulfate, doesn't throw off any toxic chemicals. 
the only problem with that process is it's not ex as exact as regular traditional etching. Um, and then through happenstance, I met an artist named Dan Weldon. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Dan, uh, but he came up with this process called solar plate etching. Um, I'll share through this presentation, I will definitely share my solar plates. Um, and I will also share the process with you, but it is a much less toxic, if not, it's considered non toxic, who knows, it uses a photopolymer. So who knows, it might have a little toxicity, but it is much safer for both the artist um, and the environment. Um, so I I got involved with solar plate etching and I just love it because I can, I can bring my drawing skills into the process very easily as well. Um, so this is a, this is just a snippet from a, one of my pieces called um, Guardian. Um, it was inspired by um, a tree that my uncle planted um, on family property when I was a kid and we would spend summers up in the Adirondacks. And one of my jobs, we all had jobs every day we had to do like rake hay or, or do a job. And one of my jobs was to water this tree. <laughs> so 50 years later, we now, my husband and I now own this property. And every time I look out my porch window, I look up through these tree branches and I'm just like, um, amazed as I see the light kind of fracturing through the branches and I see the web of branches. And as I look up, I start to feel like this, this tree is protecting um, my family. Um, so that's hence the name, um, the guardian. But this is a solar plate etching and the process where I, um, I've collaged some of the other colors into it is called Shinkale. Again, I'll speak about this a little bit um, further on. Um, this is a, a piece called The Bluff. Um, most of my work is, or my recent work is um, inspired by nature. Um, I do a lot of hiking. My husband and I spend a lot of time both hiking on Long Island and in the Adirondacks. Um, and I feel like I connect so much to um, just the, the natural environments around me. Um, they help me think like when I'm out walking, it, it kind of helps me think, clear my head, get things in focus. Um, so even though my work is inspired by nature, it's not necessarily like a rendering or a direct drawing of nature. Um, I like to kind of express the memory or the feelings that I had, or even what I was thinking about while I was walking through a place. Um, so the funny thing is that um, this was this was inspired by the Kings Park Bluff. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Nisquag River on Long Island, uh, but it's a beautiful, it is like a really beautiful place where the mouth of the Nisquag meets the um, Long Island Sound. And as you walk through the trails on the bluff, um, a lot of the bluff has been eroded away. And you look at the roots from these trees and they're almost like clinging to that, um, they're, they're clinging to that, um, that bluff for life. Um, so sometimes I look at it as they're clinging to the bluff for dear life. And sometimes I look at it like they're really wrapping their roots around that bluff and holding it and keeping it in place. Um, okay, so, um, the next slide is, um, this is called Deeper. Okay, and this was the first, um, this is the, was the first large scale solar plate um, that I ever did. It was a very daunting experience, um, I wanna say. And I, like I said, I, I had been working with um, Dan Weldon, who's a master printmaker and after I did a lot of work for him, I was doing an internship with him. He knew I was 
going for my MFA and he handed me the plate and he said, I want you to work on this plate uh, for your thesis show. Now, in the meantime, I had only been working on, um, I don't want to say very small, but most of my, the plates I was creating were about eight by 10, maybe a little bit smaller. The largest one was probably 11 by 16. So this was like a 28 by 36 plate. I was petrified. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it. And again, on one of my hikes in, um, in Connect, Connect Quad State Park, I kept thinking about um, how like your start, I, I was starting out this hike and you're, you're in the woods and you're, um, the brush was very thick and dense and the trail kind of winds through. Um, and I kind of view that as like, like a setup for a problem. Like I was struggling with this. I was struggling with how to, what should I do with this plate? How do I approach this? Um, and all of a sudden, as I started to think of it, I kind of got inspired by that hike. And I was thinking about how, oh, yeah, these obstacles are kind of cropping up in my way. And my fear of just starting was one of those obstacles. Um, and then the further I hiked or the further we walked, um, we, would, we would break out of the, the dense woods and come into little clearings. Um, every time you turned a corner, it was something new, something different, another thing would crop up. So whether it was another problem in my life that would crop, crop up or um, just another um, way of, of kind of solving a problem. Like I started viewing, viewing it um, on those terms. And then I just like somehow created this plate. So, um, Chris Ann, I, I do want to read a few of the comments, oh, and sure. there, there, there are some yellow lines that have shown up on the images. I'm sure that's unintentional. I don't know where that's coming from. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure myself. I do want to read the comments. We'll, we'll sort of look past. Um, Yoram Gelman says, and solar plates are etched with water. Um, Robin yeah. Halpern says she loves the colors, shapes and line that create the organic quality of your work. Alyssa Pritzka asks, what size are your works? I'll let you answer, Chris Ann. Okay. Um, so these, these plates are like, um, the plate itself is 28 by 36. So on the paper, I believe it was like close to 30 by 40. Um, so, which is, uh, I'll show as, as, I go through the slides, you'll see, um, you'll see the process and you can see how big the plates are um, compared to me. <laughs> but uh, go on, Barry. Oh, no, no, I'm ready for you. Oh, great, okay. Yeah. So the one, the, these, um, the one thing I love about printmaking, which is one of the, it's funny because I hated it when I was doing my undergrad was when I did my undergrad, we had to do additions of, um, 20 prints at a time, all identical. By the time I was working on my master's, um, the professor I was working with, Rick Mills, he kind of pushed me to experiment more. So he wasn't so caught up in creating these um, additions. And I felt like it was very freeing. So when I work on these large plates, I never, I, I rarely print an edition or I'll, I might print like three identical. And then I like to experiment and play with color. Um, and each plate, each time I print a plate, it's, it becomes very different for me. Um, I don't like, you know, like I don't like to repeat exactly the same colors. Um, right. So here I have, this is, this is kind of my process um, the, this is like a, wh exactly what a solar plate is. Like for those of you that don't know, uh, a solar plate is a very thin, um, steel plate that's coated with a UV light sensitive polymer. So you don't need any chemicals to etch it. You don't need any like mineral spirits or anything like that to clean up, um, after you're done with it. Um, 
So the process, it basically works where you are covering up the plate in certain areas with either opaque ink or a, trans a film transparency. Sometimes I'll draw on frosted glass, um, but wherever you draw with an opaque implement, that will block the UV light from touching the plate. Then you expo expose the plate to UV light and wherever um, the plate is exposed, that hardens the polymer. The third step in this is you, you go over the um, plate with a brush and some water. So you're washing out whatever polymer didn't get hardened. You rinse it off and then, um, then you cure it for another like five minutes and you have a plate that is like, it can be very deeply etched which is how I prefer to work, or you could have almost like a photographic image. Um, yeah. Yeah, can wonder, huh? <laughs> okay. um, so if you have any questions about the process, you can jump in. Um, otherwise, this is, um, this is a plate called, um, it's, it's called Emergence, okay? Um, and um, I'm always very drawn to color. It's funny, like I said, I rarely print in black and white. I might pull the first print off a plate in black and white, but almost always immediately after that, I, I jump right into color. Um, even like when I'm creating the plates, I'm thinking like, it, uh, I'm thinking about it in layers of color. Um, a lot of times I'll start off with an intended palette and then all of a sudden I go off, like I just go off on a tangent and I start adding other colors and changing it, um, all depending on my mood, my feelings, how I want to express what's um, going on with the plate. Um, and then when I come up with my print, it's funny, I might be thinking of, a, of it a certain way, but when I present it to, um, you know, to, you know, to other artists, to viewers. I love to hear what they think. I don't like to tell them what they should think or what they should feel when they view my work. I love to hear about what, what they're thinking about it, what emotions are being drawn out by the colors that I chose or, or by the marks the, um, that I've made. Uh, Chris Ann, I will read from the comments and to your point, uh, what people are thinking. Uh, Eileen Hoffman says, the work has such beautiful texture, it feels sculptural. Sandra Indig says, love your use of space, your use of line and color. A lesser skilled artist would not create space the way you do. Right. Um, well, thank you. Elaine Forrest says, these solar prints really convey the power of being in nature. Every root is expressed. Regina Gratis says, the different plates with the same paths, but different scenarios remind me of the life paths we awaken to each day. Some familiar, the walk down to the number one train, but different <laughs> scenarios that may play out. Mary Herbisek says, for me, the forms seem to suggest spaces that breathe and coexist within the body, such as bones, veins, and organs. And again, I'll add that's that sort of consilience of form that you're hitting. And uh, Peggy Pugh, remember, we can hear you if you're speaking. Peggy Pugh says, love your work of Long Island. I feel it in your art. Nancy Buetti, your plates are exposed once. You don't use an aquatint screen. That's the question. Okay, I, I can explain. Sometimes I, Nancy, sometimes I do use an aqua tint screen, but these, these are plates I draw directly on. Um, when, I'm, when I'm doing a drawing on glass, then I use an aqua tint screen. Regina Gratis says, lovely depth to each plate. And uh, Regina also puts a link in for another artist, uh, Renee De Los Santos, a wonderful plate maker, Norma Greenwood, beautiful work. I think we all agree 
continue, Chris Ann. You're doing a great job. Harry, can I ask a question? Of course. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I was just wondering when you laid down your original marks and you used the polymer and the water and, and everything, you, you get a, a, um, uh, an underprint. Do you work that in different stages afterwards? Um, this, this Aside solar, from the color. Um, the solar plate, once you have a plate, um, you really can't change. It, it's different than a zinc etching plate where you can continue to change the plate. Mm -hmm. um, the solar plate is once you create the plate, um, that's it. You can't really manipulate the surface again. So I do only manipulate it through changing the color. Right. Did that answer? Is that the question you were asked? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Okay. And I think that the space that we see uh, is synonymous with the depth of your seeing, your feeling, no matter what it is, it could be four square inches looking through grass. It's the depth of your own uh, seeing experience being reflected in, in what we see in that print. It's yeah. incredible. Like Thank a microcosm. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I found the, the comment also about the um, veins and bones and stuff. That's a comment that I get a lot, but I, I link that to nature as well. Like, so whether I'm walking through vines or branches, I could be, you know, passing through bones <laughs> and veins too. It's all connected to me. Um, but um, so anyway, so, so not only like as I'm printing, not I'm only am I thinking about the colors, um, uh, I'm thinking about transparency and opacity. So here's, um, these are quickly, cause I know we're kind of running out of time. These are three plates that, uh, the same plate printed three different ways. This was a, a seasonal series and, um, uh, just by changing up the, um, opacity of, the color that was printed underneath and then, or, or I should say the transparency and then playing with the opacity, it got very different feelings from the three prints. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so here, this is, this might give you a better idea as to like the size of the plate that I'm working on. Um, this is a little bit of my printing process. So here I have a, um, what I call a mono, or not what I, what is known as a monotype um, that I print first. So I get that under color. I don't always do this, but a lot of times I'll do it. I'll get that under color uh, printed on the paper first. And then when I ink up the plate um, in this particular series, I'm inking both intaglio style. So I'm inking the deeply etched lines and then I roll over the surface with um, another color um, so in this, in this case, I rolled up the surface with like an ochre color. And then, then when I printed it, this was the end result. Um, so, and it's got a very luminous, it's a, got a very luminous feeling to it, but, um, sometimes printing a plate this big, it is definitely a challenge, <laughs> especially since I was printing in the studio at LIU post, because I, I, um, don't have a press that's that big. Um, so then, um, not, o not only am I playing around, like one of my other favorite ways to work is by, um, collaging paper into the print as you're printing it. Um, so this is, this is a technique called chincole, where you're taking very thin, either rice or mulberry paper. Um, and as you, um, as you start to print, like you put a glue on the back of the paper, lay it down on the plate so that the glue gets, the glue gets glued to the paper. And then you print, like as you put it through the press, they all print together and um, your, your etching prints on top of the glued paper. Um, so this adds like a really, not only color, but very interesting texture to it. Um, so this is a small eight by eight. This is reminiscent. And in this, the next couple pieces, I, um, I hand dyed my own rice paper with, um, with inks because I was just looking for a very luminous, brilliant color, which is harder to buy. So I started inking my own um, 
or you know um, dyeing my own paper. And Christiane, Christiane yeah. I just want to read a few more comments. They're all so nice. Nancy Buetti, I love your work. It is so rich and has a feeling of mystery, yet it's so familiar. Mm -hmm. Aline Solar, what are you, well, I think you mentioned what your drawing tools are, uh, large block out materials. You, I think you mentioned that earlier. Um, Pearl Golden says, what a great program. Really enjoyed in the explanations and feelings expressed, both spoken and in the work. Bravo. Kellen Alder, gorgeous. And Jenna Lash says, it feels like I'm walking through a magical storybook. <laughs> at different times of day and in different weather. Very nice. Thank you. That is very, yeah, very uplifting to hear that. <laughs> uh, so just, uh, I'm almost at the end. This is, um, these two pieces, again, same same plate, but I started in the on the right-hand side, I started flipping the plate around. I printed it like four times and uh, rotated the plate and shifted it a little bit so that um, you could really capture the motion of the lines. Um, and this, this is my, the last plate that I just finished making. Um, it was inspired by my recent trip to Yellowstone. Uh, so I've got about 10 iterations from this right now. Um, I keep playing with it. I've been really, I, I had been really struggling to get the colors to the way I, I feel, but, um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you. Bravo. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you want to see a plate, hold on, I got a plate. <laughs> Elaine Forrest says, three amazing artists. Thank you, Lori, for curating this wonderful evening. Very inspiring on so many levels. Um, Fran apologized for having, Fran Beeler apologizes for having to leave a bit early, um, but she says she really has enjoyed the three presentations. Um, any closing remarks, Lori, or any of the artists, or of course, any questions? Go ahead, Larry, I'll unmute you, or ask you to unmute. I just wanted to tell you, um, I've never seen the process before, and I was enthralled having looked at it and uh, I really enjoyed your explaining it. Do you have a video that does a deeper explanation of how you work? You're muted. I'm muted, I know, sorry. I was doing that because the dog was barking. Um, that was I, me barking. <laughs> I don't have a video of me working specifically. I have to, I really have to figure out how to do that. Um, mm -hmm because I tend to work very directly. But I think um, if you go to solarblade.com, you can see the pro some of the process. I okay. think Weldon might have some of it, um, but it's not, you know, it's not me working, but he has some of the aqua aquatint, which is a different, a slightly different process. Okay, well, you, you've done uh, some beautiful stuff. I enjoyed looking at it a lot. I am Thank not a, uh, an abstract person, but I really did enjoy seeing that. Thank you. I just wanted to thank Kellen and Chris Ann for uh, supporting and being there uh, to do this wonderful program. Both of your work is just really, really exquisite, beautiful. You know, I'm in your both of your fan clubs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I was very happy to bring you in and uh, share your work with the rest of the group. Um, thanks to Barry for giving us this opportunity and the ATOA. It's a really wonderful organization and has really helped support so many artists. And it's, it's a great opportunity to present if you get the chance to do so. Yeah, th thank you. Um, I'll, I'll close with thanking everybody for coming. Obviously, you, Lori, and Chris Ann, as well as Kellen. Um, for presenting, but of course, all of you for sharing your thoughts. You could see the artists absorbing what you said and we're inspiring each other, but we're also at the same time learning from each other. Even a self-admitted non-abstract artist like Larry says <laughs> he's got a lot out of this and that's a lot to get out of Larry. 
Um, <laughs> so my point is we, we, we're a great team. We're a great group. We're here every Monday. Um, this talk will end up on YouTube probably in a day or so. Our previous talks are there as well. And if you want to see what's to come, we have a calendar on our website that lists the talks that are to come for till the end of this year. If you look closely, you'll see there is one talk listed that is an open format where artists are welcome to present for five to 10 minutes and everybody is welcome, unless of course you've presented uh, recently. There are so many other compliments in the chat. I wanna thank you all, ATOA, Artists Talk on Art. We're a nonprofit. You are the artist. We bring you together to talk on art. I can't thank you enough. This is a great talk, a very nice group, a large group. If you'd like to submit a proposal, look at our website. You'll see information there. If you don't, reach out to me or wherever you see it or however you feel comfortable reaching out and we'll send you our uh, documents so you can fill out for 2022 any proposal you have. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, thank you, Barry. Thank you. Great. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thanks for Good tuning night. in. Thanks, Lori. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Lori. It was a great group put together. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> thank you. We're great. all feeling very inspired. Great. Me too. <laughs> okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you again. Have a great night. Okay. It's a privilege um, to see it. Thank you. Great okay. job, everyone. Okay. All righty.